This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very grateful for the invitation to take part in this conference. I'm um, enormously pleased to be here, and I want to formally offer Heathrow my congratulations on its 400th anniversary. Unlike the previous speaker, I've never studied here or at any Jesuit institution. I've never taught here, but nevertheless, for as long as I've studied or taught as a theologian in Britain, Heathrow has been an important presence, creating a sense of institutional stability and seriousness for British Catholic theology. <coughs> Quietly and with very little fuss, doing a great deal to ensure that Catholic theology does in fact exist in this country, um, and that it's been pursued seriously, creatively, and faithfully. Still, while I'm really pleased to be here, I must confess that it's a slightly daunting task for one who is not a Jesuit nor even an intellectual historian, to be asked to pronounce on the question of whether there is such a thing as a Jesuit tradition in theology. Or at least at first sight it's a daunting task. I'm relieved to say that on closer inspection it turns out to be such an easy question that it's not so scary after all. <laughs> but it seems to me that there's very obviously and very inescapably a two-part answer to this question. First of all, there can be no doubt that there have been a host of major Jesuit theologians over the past four and a half centuries or so. From the 16th century onward, the history of theology is littered with the names of influential Jesuits. One might mention Suarez, Molina, and Bellarmine, relatively early in the society's history, or in the 19th century, Perón, Kleutgen, Pesch, Nelbrunin. <coughs> Jesuit strength is particularly striking when we come near to our own time, if one asks about the towering figures in Catholic theology over the last hundred years, and it has been, I would say, quite an exciting hundred years uh, for Catholic theology, then an extraordinary proportion of the names which come to mind are Jesuits. In fact, almost all of the names which do first come to mind are Jesuits. Karl Rahner, Henri de Lubac, Bernard Lonergan, and hans Urs von Balthasar, just to begin the list. Balthazar didn't always remain a Jesuit, it should be said. He came a little late to the party, having a doctorate under his belt before he started. And he left a little early, parting ways with the society in 1950, was when he was in his mid-40s. But at least for now, I'll, I'll keep him on my list. <laughs> so it's easy to affirm that there is a strong Jesuit tradition in theology in the sense that there exists a history of strong Jesuit theologians. But secondly, it's also quite easy to see that there is no Jesuit tradition in theology, if by this one were to mean a coherent school with a shared set of positions to defend, or a distinctive theological method to hand down from one generation to the next. There have been, it's true, times and places where Jesuits have formed or have been seen to form a kind of school. One thinks particularly in moral theology of a Jesuit association with casuistry and probabilism in the 17th century, made famous by the polemic against it in Pascal's Lettre Provinciale. Or again, one might look to a strong Jesuit association with papal authority and papal teaching in the 19th century, when Jesuit theologians mostly based in Rome played significant roles in promoting the definition of the Immaculate Conce Conception as a dogma, in drafting the documents of the First Vatican Council, including the definition of papal infallibility, and also in drafting Itani Patris, and even some of the founding documents of Catholic social teaching. So we can say that there have been Jesuit schools of theology, that there have been from time to time particular Jesuit traditions, but it's simply not possible to stitch these together into an overarching narrative to speak of a Jesuit school of theology, a Jesuit tradition. One easy way to illustrate this negative point is by focusing on the recent period. The, the four theologians I mentioned, Rahner, Lonergan, De Lubac, and Balthazar, defeat any attempt to group them together as a unified theological cohort. There's no common project to be found among them, no shared method, no coherent vision. Um, incidentally, while I want to focus on these four figures from the last hundred years, it's of course entirely arbitrary for me to stop with them. One might equally extend the list, if one's looking in the last hundred years or so, to include Jesuit liberation theologians such as John Sabrino and Ignacio de Curia, or one might want to mention Jean Donnelou and John Courtney Murray, or Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. Rousselot just about makes it into my hundred-year criterion. 
Maybe we should also speak of a number of Jesuits who pursue very serious work on interreligious dialogue. There are, in other words, a host of toes that I'll be treading on by not mentioning other names. But to keep things manageable, I'll explore for a few minutes these first four I mentioned who, if not the only modern Jesuit giants, are certainly without doubt modern Jesuit giants. Let's take first then Rahner and Lonergan. Karl Rahner, a German, and Bernard Lonergan, a Canadian. So I'm afraid, um, since we did Britain in the first hour, it's going to be a little light on, on Britain in, in the company of Jesuits I'm talking about here. But so, so Rahner, a German, Lonergan, a Canadian, were for a while grouped together under the banner of transcendental Thomism. But this hasn't turned out to be a very happy classification. The idea was supposed to be that both are pursuing a kind of Thomism, showing an allegiance to the thought of Thomas Aquinas, and that both of them were doing this in a way shaped by the ideas of the 18th century philosopher Immanuel Kant, and that finally, standing behind them both, was another Jesuit figure, Joseph Marichal, a Belgian who wrote a five-volume work on the point of departure of metaphysics, aiming to bring scholasticism into conversation with modern Kantian thought. So I think this label, transcendental Thomism, stuck for a while, in part because it's pleasantly alliterative and impressively confusing, <laughs> <laughs> and in part because people were looking for ways to spot patterns. But really, on many levels, it doesn't work particularly well. I'm not so sure about Lonergan, but I know Ron are well enough to be confident that he is, in fact, no more a Thomist than any theologian of his generation. Thomas was in everyone's bloodstream, but it wasn't a particular goal of Rahner to be Thomistic. It's true that his original unsuccessful doctoral thesis was presented as an interpretation of a snippet of Aquinas' thought. But this I would take to be the result of the intellectual and ecclesial context of the time rather than an indication of any distinctive or decisive commitment to Thomism. So at least for Rahner, transcendental Thomism isn't a particularly illuminating label. I suspect it doesn't work much better for Lonergan. I haven't noticed in, in Lonergan's scholarship any great eagerness to carry on using this category. So if we drop the transcendental Thomist label, where does that leave the Rahner-Lonergan pairing? I have to say that the association between them doesn't seem to me particularly natural. The atmosphere, the ambiance of their thought is very different. It's not only that the center of gravity of Lonergan's writings is in philosophy, whereas for Rahner it's clearly in theology. It's not only that Lonergan's idiom emerges from an Anglo-Saxon, a rather analytical style of thought where, for which scientific reasoning is the natural paradigm, whereas Rahner is more steeped in continental thought with a stronger inclination to reach towards existentialism and phenomenology. There's also a sort of foundationalism driving through Lonergan's whole project, an urge to step back from the mess of things and sort out once and for all the right way of thinking to work out a universal theory of meaning and a universal method that can be applied to any area whatsoever. And this isn't, on my reading, part of the character of Rahner's writings. Rahner wrote hundreds, thousands of essays on an enormous range of topics. And though there is a unified, closely interlinked set of themes to which he tends to return, what is fundamentally driving him is not the urge to work out a system once and for all, but the desire to address the particular pastoral, practical, intellectual problems facing the church. Browsing Lonergan's work, you'll find much discussion of eight functional specialties, four levels of consciousness, a universal pattern within, within which all intellectual advances falls. And one comes across, as in, in no other writer I've ever read, phrases like, in the 77th place, <laughs> or even in the 111th place. <laughs> Browsing Rahner's works, on the other hand, one comes across an enormous profusion of essays from some of the more expected topics, Grace, Trinity, Christology, Mary, Bible and the Church, the role of the Magisterium, the development of doctrine, death, to an enormous range of others, from the restoration of the diaconate to the televising of the mass to the role of Latin as a church language, from the theology of leisure to the theology of power to the theology of childhood, just all over the place, everything under the sun comes into his essays. So Rahner and Monaghan don't, to my mind, form a natural pair. What about the other two? Henri de Lubac, a French Jesuit, and hans Urs von Balthasar, a Swiss-German, are perhaps the closest of these four. 
and certainly the most mutually approving pair. But even they were not so very similar. De Lubach was essentially an historical theologian, while Balthasar indulged in speculation and intellectual construction on a much larger scale. De Lubach made a few really decisive theological interventions on the relation of nature and grace in particular and in ecclesiology. And he deployed historical learning to develop and defend these interventions, unearthing text after text from the tradition to call into question the way his contemporaries tended to think. Well, Balthazar was at an early stage, as we might now put it, mentored by de Lubac, and picked up some of the same style of argument through this deployment of, a, of wide erudition. His theological project was really quite different. Not for Balthazar, the introduction into the debate of a few key theological ideas, but rather the construction of the most wide-ranging, all-encompassing theological vision imaginable. They don't, then, all seem to hang together as the 20th century incarnation of a Jesuit school of theology. In fact, when people do wish to divide recent theology into schools, they'll typically pit two of these thinkers, Rahner and Balthasar, against each other and see them as representing two quite distinct directions in which Catholic theology can face. Rahner is associated with one journal, Concilium, which was founded, as its title hints, to continue the impetus of the Second Vatican Council, and Balthazar with another, Communio, which was set up more or less to resist the particular direction of Concilium. Rahner is linked, as I've already mentioned, with Kant and a kind of embrace of modernity, Balthazar with the resistance of modernity in the name of tradition. Rahner is then typically linked with adjournamento, the updating impulse of the Second Vatican Council. Balthazar with ressourcement, the, the return to the sources or impulse also around the time. Now, I wouldn't entirely endorse these characteristic ways of contrasting the two dominant figures of 20th century Catholic theology. I think Rahner is much less Kantian than he's typically portrayed, and Balthazar is much less in line with tradition than he's often thought to be. In fact, I would take Rahner to be, by some distance, the more traditional of the two thinkers. So if the way in which they're characterized isn't always on target, the sense that they really do point in contrasting directions is pretty hard to avoid for anyone who reads um, in any depth in both of them. So if I'm right, we have a history in which many major theologians have been produced by the Society of Jesus, and yet in which there is no one Jesuit theological style or school or tradition. What should we make of this? There are various ways to account for the sheer strength of the Jesuits in theology, though I'm not enough of a historian to pronounce on the matter too definitively, but presumably the fact that the Society of Jesus has from its beginnings in Ignatius' time had education, including higher education, as part of its mission, it may have something to do with its theological vigor. It's an organization towards which I suppose you might be drawn if you're an academically inclined young man, and which then, in the course of a long formation, can help such a young man develop his full intellectual potential. And maybe there's a certain circularity <coughs> to theological success. Um, if a congregation has a history of producing theologians or intellectuals in general. Presumably young men inclined in this direction will feel an attraction to join this society rather than another, or rather than entering a diocesan seminary. I wonder though whether another cause of the strength of Jesuit theology over the centuries to consider is a certain theological weakness at its origins. The Jesuits have no Thomas Aquinas, they have no Bonaventure to look back to. They have, of course, St. Ignatius, just as the Dominicans have Dominic and the Franciscans have St. Francis. And there were, as I've mentioned, some distinguished intellectual figures from early in the society's history, but there's no one intellectual giant with whom the identity of Jesuits is bound up. No one theologian to whom all must show loyalty. So perhaps the very thing which stops Jesuits forming a coherent school is a source of theological strength. Because they don't have a predetermined theological hero, they may be less likely to suppose that their calling intellectually is to study, to understand, to wrestle over the interpretation of their one great intellectual. And this perhaps has released a certain energy of its own. 
So if I'm saying that it can be an advantage to lack a towering theological figure at the origins of one's order, I don't mean to imply that engagement with the past is a waste of time for theologians. These outstanding thinkers among the 20th century Jesuits were all in their different ways seriously engaged with the pre-modern theological tradition. And I don't even want to say anything against Thomas Aquinas. I don't want to suggest that engagement with Aquinas in particular is anything but an asset for a theologian. And again, Thomas and Thomism were all very much part of at least three of the four thinkers I've been discussing. This was the natural result not only of the intrinsic importance in the tradition of St. Thomas, but also of the mandatory role that Aquinas had in the studies of all those training for the priesthood in the period uh, from the late 19th century to the Second Vatican Council. What the Jesuits did not have, however, was a kind of redoubled allegiance to Aquinas or to any other pre-modern theologian, deriving from their own identity as Jesuits. They could range over the past as they saw fit. And this may have also enabled a certain flexibility and vigor in seeking to confront the particular needs of the present of their own period. So where have I come so far? I'm proposing, first of all, that the Society of Jesus has a strong history of producing theologians, especially so over the last century, where there was, if not a Jesuit dominance of the theological scene, at least something pretty close to that. Secondly, I'm suggesting that Jesuit theology nevertheless doesn't form in any obvious way a tradition in the sense of the handing down of a recognizably consistent style or sort of theological convictions. And thirdly, I'm proposing a link between the two phenomena. Jesuits are not, by virtue of their existence as Jesuits, committed to any particular theological system or figure. And this may be a root not only of their diversity, but also of their strength. So then the question is, do I have to let diversity be the very last word about Jesuit theology? Almost, I think, but not quite. <coughs> While there's no such thing as a particular Jesuit school, it may be possible to trace, at least in recent times, I'd like to propose, some shared preoccupations, themes and concerns which play an important role across otherwise very different Jesuit theologies. Maybe Jesuits are scratching at some of the same itches, even if they're scratching at them in very different ways. Now, one has to be careful not to push the search for distinctiveness, even this modest conception of distinctiveness at the level of shared problems and preoccupations, too hard. Jesuit theologians are committed to the same scripture and tradition as other Catholic theologians. They're living in the same period, economic, social, and intellectual as other theologians, facing the same realities of church and world. They don't fundamentally exist in a separate bubble. Consider, for instance, the phenomenon of liberation theology, surely the most novel and vigorous uh, movement to emerge in Catholic theology in the last 45 years. One could say something about a strong Jesuit interest in liberation theology or in the broader project of thinking faith and social justice together. And one may want to say something about the importance of particular Jesuit thinkers like John Sabrino, Juan Luis Segundo, Ignacio Elecuria. And yet liberation theology is a phenomenon which cuts across boundaries between religious congregations, as well to a lesser degree across boundaries between uh, denominational divisions. So in addition to prominent Jesuit figures and Jesuit martyrs, liberation theology has a founding figure in Gustavo Gutierrez, who began as a diocesan and became a Dominican priest. It has a leading light in Leonardo Boff, who was for most of his career as a theologian of Franciscan. It has precursors and supporters in diocesan bishops such as Manuel Lavain and Helder Camara. One can't really expect theology, it seems, to divide itself tidily across the boundaries of the religious orders. Still, I'd like to propose that it's possible to discern certain distinctive preoccupations among Jesuits. Maybe not unique, but at least distinctively Jesuit preoccupations. And the one that interests me the most so the one I'd like to focus on in the remainder of this lecture is a preoccupation with the question of integration, the problem of integrating theology and spirituality or theology and experience. This is a concern which is presumably rooted in the common Ignatian inheritance of Jesuits. In Ignatian thought and practice, there's a distinct focus on experience in relation to the things of faith, one could say. You could trace this in a variety of ways in the notions of finding God in all things, of 
contemplation in action, in practices of the examine, examination of conscience, imaginative prayer with scripture, and all kinds of ways the bringing of experience and faith together seem quite key to Jesuit Ignatian practice. In theology then, or at least in, in Jesuit theology of the last hundred years or so, this concern for bringing experience of the things of faith together transforms itself, it seems to me, into a preoccupation with the integration of theology and spirituality. This can be traced in all four of the theologians on whom I've been focusing. Even Lonergan could not have had a drier, more detached, more rationalist style with his in the 77th place. Even his work is distinctly marked by this concern. He has a tidy system of four levels of consciousness to which you can, in a, in a double move, correlate eight functional specialisms. And it all seems to be quite sorted, but then, to the dismay of at least some of his interpreters, he introduces a fifth level, the level of being unreservedly in love, to have a place for grace in his whole system. I wouldn't say he, that he entirely succeeds in pulling off the integration, but it's clear that he's scratching at the itch. So perhaps the most noticeably untidy aspect of his extraordinarily tidy system, the most fascinating and yet troublesome aspect of it for his interpreters, is driven by precisely this integrating concern. Of the four figures, Balthazar probably drew the most explicit attention to this whole theme of integration. In a phrase often repeated by admirers, he describes his own theology as a kneeling theology. Some may fundamentally do their theology sitting at a desk in an academic style, but his is done on his knees, he says. And he wrote an influential essay entitled Theology and Sanctity, lamenting the divide which has arisen since the scholastic period between theology and sanctity or theology and spirituality. He launches the essay with the suggestion that we should be shocked and troubled by the absence of theologian saints in modern times. In the early centuries of the church, the great <coughs> theologians were almost always saints, Augustine, Athanasius, and so on. But since the scholastic period, this has been quite rare. In itself, this seems a slightly odd line to take, putting quite a lot of confidence, more than I would be inclined to, in the unchanging nature of the canonization process. <laughs> Some of those early theologian saints don't appear in the history books as the most pleasant or the most peaceable. <laughs> but there's also a more plausible way in which Balthazar contrasts pre- and post-scholastic periods. He points out, and I think here most scholars would agree with him, that none of the fathers would have thought to distinguish between their theology on the one hand and their reflections on spiritual life on the other. They wouldn't have understood a divide, in other words, between spirituality and dogmatic theology. Balthazar laments, then, that this divorce of the mystical, the spiritual, the experiential from theology. This divide which has arisen later within the tradition and which leads, leaves both sides impoverished, and he calls for a new kind of unity. How should we achieve this unity? According to Balthazar, systematic, dogmatic theologians need to take the saints more seriously. On the one hand, on a general level, we theologians need to learn from the saints the attitude of prayer, the atmosphere of seeking in prayer, a certain way of receiving revelation. And on the other hand, we ought to take their quite specific experiences as a theological source, Balthazar suggests. So for instance, he presumes that Christ's inner experience of the passion is of prime significance for the theological understanding of redemption, but that unfortunately it's just not much described in the New Testament. We ought to turn then to other sources to fill this out, including the graces of participation in the passion given to the churches in the experience of the saints. That's Balthazar's phrase. We ought to look to what's been given to the church in the experience of the saints, this participation in the passion. So to put it crudely, New Testament doesn't give us quite enough data to do the theology from. We should supplement it with extra stuff we learn from the mystics. Balthazar is usually seen by his admirers not only as advancing the outlines of a program for the reunification of theology and spirituality, but as himself carrying out this program in an exemplary way. 
He worked closely with Adriana von Speyer, a woman who had a range of unusual mystical experiences, including experiences of participating in Christ's passion, and whom he very clearly considered to be a saint. He described their work as two halves of a single whole, and drew on her experiences to guide his reflections on Holy Saturday, and at least at certain points to shape his Trinitarian theology. It's not only his collaboration with von Speyer that's relevant here to the question of integrating theology and spirituality, it's also the style of the manner of his theology that his supporters see as overcoming unfortunate divides between intellect and affect, between dogma and experience. Balthazar was enormously erudite, undoubtedly one of the great and creative intellects of the theology of the 20th century. But he never held an academic post, and his writing is unencumbered by some of the carefulness and the qualifications and the engagement with one's fellow scholars that often weigh down academic prose. He can often speak very directly to his readers and convey a vivid sense of the existential weight of what's at stake in theology. The response to Balthazar and to his theological style is quite varied. As I've been indicating, he has many admirers, and I know that for some, reading his work is a liberation. This combination of breadth of learning and vision with a directness of style is, for these readers, a breath of fresh air. It's theology, finally, as it really ought to be. To my mind, though, it's not quite so satisfactory. Balthazar may be bridging the gap between theology and spirituality, but he does so in a way, it seems to me, that ultimately reinforces the existence of this very gap. It ultimately reinforces the difference between the two. He bridges the divide ultimately by modeling a way to do theology that's less rigorous, less self-critical, less intellectually responsible than one would expect serious theology to be. If one excuses this on the grounds that he's doing theology in a more spiritual key, the inescapable implication is of a trade-off, an opposition between serious intellectual work and the mystical or the spiritual. As I mentioned earlier, Balthazar didn't always remain a Jesuit. His split from the society, which was a painful one, was ultimately concerned, it seems, from, with his commitment to von Speer and what she believed that God was calling the two of them to do, to, to found a new um, secular institute. The Jesuits weren't willing to take on responsibility for her and for the new project. Um, as an aside, I have to say that my sympathy is with the Jesuits. Um, Balthazar claimed for von Speer some really extraordinary ex kinds of experience and knowledge and powers. Um, this is in itself a little unsettling, but what's even more unsettling is the fact that the only access to von Speer was in effect through him. He had received her into the church, he was her spiritual director, he was her amanuensis, he wrote down everything that she dictated, uh, he was her editor and her publisher. And it seems that she was actually unable to discuss her experiences with anyone other than him. So any possibility of sifting, testing, critically examining the purported experience and the more or less supernatural knowledge he attributed to her seems to have been ruled out in principle. So you know, what a headache you can imagine for Jesuit superiors to think what to do with this um, Jesuit who's coming along saying we must embrace this woman and only I can you know, talk to her or understand her. Or, um. So one way of reading this event, then, of Balthazar's departure from the Jesuits, would be to say that his way of marrying theology and spirituality, intellect and experience, his way of mixing enormous intellectual learning with somewhat uncritical reception and use of an extraordinary spiritual experience, that this was not a Jesuit way of um, integrating theology and spirituality. He was scratching at a distinctively Jesuit itch then, but maybe not doing so in a particularly Jesuit way. So let me turn finally to Karl Rahner, in whose work I think we see the best and the most interesting 20th century effort at this integrating task. The integrative instinct can be seen in Rahner's work, I'd like to suggest, on two levels. One is in some of his most central and programmatic theological claims, and the other is in the style of the manner in which he does his theology as a whole. 
I have to say that the best person, the person best qualified in the English-speaking world, or, or probably the whole world, to comment on this question of theology and spirituality in Rahner is in fact a Philip, I don't know where he's gone, the speaker who immediately preceded me. Um, so it's a little embarrassing to talk about it here. Um, but one point that Philip makes very emphatically in his book on Rahner, and on Rahner and Ignatian spirituality, which was mentioned in his introduction, is that the relevant issue when you're talking about the theology and spirituality can't be uh, one about the, the spirituality of the individual theologian. It can't be about Rahner the man and the quality of his own spiritual life or the rootedness of his theology and his own experience. Although some of the hagiography around Rahner tends to point you in that direction. You should believe Rahner because he was clearly so integrated, such a holy man, so spiritual, and this is coming out of his theology. Um, so in the same way, my reference to the style in which Rahner does his theology isn't a reference to his own personal humility or prayerfulness or anything of this sort, but rather to something about the nature and the manner of his theological writings. First of all, in any case, let me say something about a couple of Rahner's most central, programmatic, and it has to be said provocative, theological claims. The two claims I'll mention are actually very closely related. Rahner famously declared that all theology is anthropology, on the one hand, and that theology must make a transcendental turn on the other. Now, um, just for the few of you who may not have a completely technical theological training, a little bit of straightforward explanations in order here. In saying that all theology must be anthropology, Rahner didn't mean to say that theology should become a social science and to be left to the likes of Margaret Mead or Clifford Gibbs. Anthropology is a word that theologians use for a subdiscipline of their own field, the aspect of theology which is concerned with humanity. And Rahner's claim is that this doctrine within theology, this subfield of theology, is absolutely central, and that all else must have a vital reference to it. What does it mean to speak of a transcendental turn in theology? It's a reference to the modern turn to the subject, and especially to the version associated with Kant. Theology must inquire about the conditions of the possibility of belief. It must inquire about what it is about human experience that means that the dogmas of the faith can be relevant and meaningful to us. So I describe these two claims as provocative, and they've indeed provoked a great deal of criticism over the years. Rahner is often seen as selling out to philosophy, trapped in the thought world of Kant. And he's often seen as so anxious to justify Christianity before the court of modern opinion that with this sort of claim that all theology is anthropology, he's being very reductive, uh, stripping Christianity down, contorting it into something that a modern skeptical thinker might accept. So we'll just ditch all the grand claims and say it's nothing but theology just to make modern people find it acceptable. That's the way Rahner sometimes read. Now, I think these are misreadings, and I've argued against them at some length, as has Philip Ending. They are, it must be admitted, readings that can sound quite plausible if one considers the slogans I've mentioned taken in isolation. But they become less so as one becomes familiar with Rahner's broader writings. In fact, at those points where Rahner can appear to be most decisively announcing a philosophical commitment, or to be pushing a reductive path in theology, what he's best read as doing, I think, is pursuing precisely this Jesuit concern for the integration of theology and spirituality, or of doctrine and experience. To say that all theology must be anthropology is to say that anything that we believe about God or about Christ or even about angels, if it's part of the faith, it must have significance for us in our Christian life. It must have significance to experience. It must matter to us in some way. Theology cannot be about spinning some grand narrative or some super good metaphysics at which we marvel in a detached way. This is something we can know, rather thinks, a priori. Anything which is revealed to us must be significant for our salvation, and so it must profoundly affect us in some way. So the, the Kantian language of a transcendental turn, I think, is in large part the sort of clothing for a Jesuit kind of claim that any and all theology must at the same time be spirituality, you could say. 
So I think that the, the urge to integrate theology and spirituality is manifest, even if often missed and misinterpreted, in some of Rahner's key declarations about the nature of theology. And then to my mind, the even more significant way in which this concern makes itself felt, and I would say that in which the integration is actually achieved in Rahner's thought, is in the manner of um, nearly all Rahner's theology. I've, I've already indicated Rahner was enormously prolific, and while people often like to take all that he did and piece it together into a grand system, he didn't tend to present his own thought in this way. He was fond of describing himself as a theological dilettante. As I mentioned, he published hundreds and thousands of relatively short essays. And the, address, the essays address an enormous range of often quite concrete problems, problems faced by Catholics as individuals or by segments of the church or by the church as a whole at a particular time. So the orientation of Ron's work, as I've already suggested, seems to be fundamentally pastoral. For example, his most famous proposal, the theory of the anonymous Christian, has its origins in the question of what should one say to a pious Catholic whose relations, maybe their grown children, have lapsed, have left the faith. Do you have to say, sorry, they met Christ, they rejected him, they're going to hell, that's the end of it. This pastoral problem of what to say to such people drives what people take to be Rahner's intervention in, into religious dialogue. <laughs> Rahner is sometimes thought of as an apologetic theologian because he shows a recurring concern for what's believable to the modern person and for the need to articulate the faith in such a way that its credibility to these modern people will be clear. This is a recurring theme of Rahner. And yet, when you look closely, he's rarely actually writing for unbelievers, for genuine atheists or agnostics. I think even in this sort of apparently apologetic area, He's best understood not actually as an apologetic theologian, but as a pastoral theologian, theologian addressing a spiritual problem facing the educated modern Christian, the problem of what he would call intellectual schizophrenia. I have to say that a, a student of mine who suffers mental illness really dislikes uh, our us theologians using the term intellectual schizophrenia, not only because schizophrenia is no longer understood as what's now um, dual personality disorder or something, um, but because maybe using mental illness as a, as a um, theological shorthand isn't such a good idea. But, so let's say, that Rahner would have at the time have said of intellectual schizophrenia, let's say a kind of fractured intellect. Um, this is the problem of a, of a modern person who, who uses modern technology and there may be a scientist and they're a doctor and they accept all that and then they've got their faith and they have no idea how they go together so they just keep them separate. So his concern is not fundamentally to defend the rationality of the faith, in other words, but rather to help believers absorb their faith in a fuller, more real way, to bring it into a living contact with the whole of their intellectual life. So nearly all of Rahner's work, it seems to me, integrates theology and spirituality in one quite particular sense. It brings them together insofar as the role of a theology, even at its most rigorous, uh, its most speculative, its purpose, is precisely to address the spiritual difficulties facing the church and its members. So on that level, at least, I'd like to propose Rahner as a kind of model for theology, if not the only model of theology, at least a model for a very good integrated way of doing theology. I'm nearly done a little over time here. But I don't think I'd quite like to say that we can look at Rahner taken in the round, if we look at him in the round, we have the ideal solution to the general problem I've been discussing, the really definitive scratching of this particular itch, the really definitive model of a Jesuit integration of theology and spirituality. But we have to ask, why is Rahner so frequently misunderstood, so often seen <coughs> to be in the control of philosophy or reducing theology? Um, and while part of the answer may lie in ecclesial politics, in a prior desire by some interpreters to find reasons to dismiss Rahner, I don't think the whole of the answer lies there. Partly we have to say that Rahner himself was responsible, that at some points he positively invites misinterpretation, and that more generally the philosophical density and the technical difficulty of his writing simply impede its reception. And in this sense, I don't think he can be taken as an ideal um, representative of the integration of theology and spirituality. That's, that's not what you really want when you finally say, 
this is it, somebody's achieved a way of doing theology that isn't split from spirituality, but none of us can understand it. It's probably not. <laughs> so it seems to me the task still lies ahead for the Jesuits. I know that many of them in their lives and in their role as teachers already manifest this sort of deep integration. But the task of exhibiting such an integration in full-scale articulated theology for all to see is a task yet to be accomplished, I think. So perhaps on this 400th anniversary celebration, we need not only to be grateful for all that's been accomplished at Heathrop over the last few centuries, but we need to keep a close eye on what's coming up next, what will come out of Heathrow, and whether finally the solution to this Jesuit itch will, will come soon from one of your current scholastics. Or